18 months of revolution, five and a half years of mass strikes, 11 and a half years actually since we saw mass protests in the streets of, uh, of Cairo, of Alexandria, across Egypt, uh, in support of the Second Intifada. And tens of thousands of school students and students came out and protested then. And it was the beginning, if you like, of the culture of protest that preceded the revolution of 2011 by just over 10 years. And so where does that leave us? I've been a revolutionary socialist for a good part of my adult life. And actually for most of that period, when I talked about the role of the working class in changing the world in the Middle East, this was something of an abstract conception. It was not until the last four or five years that you could actually see the possibility of that being realised. And that now, I think, after 18 months of revolution uh, unfolding across the region, we can see the prospects of the realisation of much of what we've hoped for for a, long, for a very long time. But on the other hand, we can also see how it may not turn out that way. We can see the absolute urgency and necessity of building organisation that can help work on turning those forces in the direction that we want them to go, which is liberation, not only for the workers of the Middle East. Um, not only for the workers of the Middle East and for the poor of the Middle East, but also for humanity as a whole. Because, of course, what's unfolding in the Arab world and the Arab Spring, the Arab revolutions, is part of a global process. It's part of a global process of resistance against austerity, against capitalism, against neoliberalism, against the 1% of humanity who will lord it over the 99%, and that we are part of this process of resistance as well. What I want to talk about in this meeting will start with looking at the interlacing of the political and the social aspects of this revolutionary process in the Arab world, their essential unity above at the level of the state and the ruling class and their essential unity below. But this is only a starting point from which we have to approach the problem of their separation and the walls between them, between the political and the social souls of the revolution that are constantly rebuilt as quickly as we fracture them and the kind of organisation that we need to build in order to fracture them for good. And that this rests on an understanding that these contradictions, these forces, these processes work themselves out in real places, in the real lives and in the mundane and everyday struggle to survive as much as in moments of exhilaration uh, and protest of hundreds of thousands in the streets. And that they are worked out in the decisions and choices of men and women just like ourselves. I want to explore in this meeting a little bit a conception of revolution, which the Russian revolutionary Vladimir Lenin takes up in his uh, very important pamphlet, State and Revolution, which was written, in fact, on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, where he talks about the idea of a real people's revolution. He looks back to a, to a phrase that Karl Marx used when discussing the, the Paris Commune uh, of, 18, uh, of 1870, 1871, where he talked about the, uh, the real people's revolution that took place there. But Lenin discusses this in the context of a real people's re revolution which has to be led by the working class, that the role of the working class in this revolution is as a leader, a revolutionary leader of the people against the bourgeoisie. I'm not saying that we can yet see this realised, but I'm saying that the prospects that we can see this realised are much more close than they have been for, for generations. And that understanding this requires an underst a wider understanding of what we mean by the political side of the revolution, the political soul of the revolution, than simply seeing it as a question of the struggle for, uh, for democratic reforms or for some kind of democratic transition from above but also that we have to get away from what Lenin calls in State and Revolution, called the lifeless antithesis between abstract ideals of revolutions that we might like to see in history books or political science textbooks or in our own publications. In Lenin's case, he was talking about an antithesis and theory between the bourgeois revolution and the proletarian revolution. I think in our, in our case, we could talk about it in terms of a, a, a very lifeless conception of the relationship between the democratic and the social souls of the revolution. And I will, I will talk 
in more detail later about what I think is one of the crucial elements in this. It's actually about a special kind of people. And again, this goes back to another publication by Lenin, the pamphlet What Is To Be Done, where he talked about the need to create an organisation of revolutionaries rooted in the workplace who would be, as he put it, tribunes of the people and not just trade union secretaries. The people who would unite in themselves, in their own being, in their own struggle, in their own everyday practice, the political and the social. However, this must take account of the actual balance of class forces, the differential timescales of the revolutionary process in, in, in societies that are uneven in so many, in so many ways. And, and it must involve an understanding that there is no arena of struggle that can be closed at a moment like this. Not the workplaces, not the streets, not the ballot box, everywhere where the struggle can, be, can, can take place to unite the struggle of the, uh, to unite the, the political and the social aspects of the revolution in order to lead it to completion. So let's start with the question of the unity of the political and the social. At one level, this might seem a kind of self-evident thing to say, but I think it, were, it, it is absolutely worth stressing because the dominant narrative of the Arab revolutions has generally been, particularly in the Western media, has been that these were fairly limited openings towards a democratic transition from dictatorship, which then many of these bourgeois commentators have become rather disenchanted with when it produced parliaments uh, dominated by Islamists and the apparent victory of, uh, of Islamist political forces. And then some of them have concluded that the transition was not worth, uh, worth supporting in the first place. And others have also looked at the very real, uh, at the very real question of the lack of actual, of actual change at the level of the state. Um, the, continuing, uh, the continuing dominance of the army in Egypt and in other, and in, in other states, the, the still living core of the, old, of the old regimes, and concluded that it wasn't a revolution, it wasn't a revolution at all. And do, often what generally gets written out of this process in this kind of narrative is the social side of the struggle. Actually, that people miss because they look for... Uh, they, they, they look only, only back to, uh, to the revolution beginning in 2000 and 2011, uh, in massive, the massive protests in Tahrir Square and so on. They look at it in, term, it, it in terms of something that came out of the sky, rather than seeing the massive role played by the workers' movement in Egypt and Tunisia, in the massive strikes that took place before the revolution that actually broke down the resilience of the old regime and raised the, social, raised the demands and the struggle against, against neoliberalism and against the regime and against the, and against the dictatorship from the perspective of the struggle in the workplaces. And that that was part of, it was, the, it was an absolutely crucial and fundamental element of, uh, of the revolution happening in the first place. So if there is a question of unity of the political and the social dimensions of the revolution from above, I would say that the first, the first point to make is that this is because the nature of the regimes across the Middle East that are being shaken by this revolutionary process are very similar, that they unite in themselves dictatorship, internal repression on, a very, on an absolutely horrific scale, they unite in themselves a neoliberal agenda, not one of them has... Uh, put up any kind of resistance to the onward march of, uh, of neoliberalism, and most of it have implemented <coughs> the policies of privatisation, of cuts, of the destruction of the public sector, of the forcing the poor to pay for health and education several times over, to the enrichment of the very richest people in society, <coughs> that they have implemented, implemented this and deepened it uh, where, wherever possible, and that also they are part of a global, all of the regimes in the region, are part of a, uh, of a regional equilibrium with imperialism, with most of them absolutely concretely direct partners with the US and Western imperial powers, and the ones that appear not to be actually accommodate to it and de facto play a role of... Uh, uh, of accommodating with that, uh, with that balance of, uh, of forces and have no way to challenge it. I'm thinking, for example, the Syrian regime, which has for a long time concretely taken positions where it said, yes, we'll support, for example, Hezbollah in, uh, in, in Lebanon, but actually has no way of challenging imperialism and is not an anti-imperialist, not an anti-imperialist force by any shape or form. <coughs> 
If you're talking about specific examples, say within an individual country, about the unity of the political and social aspects of, uh, 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 of what the revolution is challenging. You only have to look at, for example, personality like Ahmed Ez, who's the um, senior figure in the ruling National Democratic Party before the revolution, a steel tycoon, uh, a steel magnate who in fact controlled vast, vast proportion of steel production in Egypt and also sat on the key policy committees in the National Democratic Party, uniting in his own person the, the uh, uh, political dictatorship and, neo and neoliberalism. And you look at the operation of the police state and the dictatorship in, in, in Egypt and you, can see this, and you can see this worked out. However, there has also always been a unity that's forged from, from below, expressed in the slogan of the 25th of January revolution, bread, freedom, social justice, which was taken up and, ha and is still taken up by millions of people in, in Egypt and across, and across the region. You could see a unity being forged from below in the strikes in, uh, in Mahalla, uh, Kubra, the, te the textile town, um, which was the, the heart of the strike wave from 2000, late 2006 onwards, where they went from demands that were about what was happening in their own workplace, their own corrupt bosses, the fact that they hadn't got their pay and their bonuses on time, to starting to demand the get, getting rid of the, of the corrupt unions that, that, uh, that dominated the, the workplace that were run by the um, uh, that were run by the government to demanding a national minimum wage uh, that would have benefited a rise in the national minimum wage which would have benefited uh, all Egyptian all Egyptian workers and working and, and standing in solidarity with the Palestinians um, during the uh, Israeli attacks on, on, on Gaza you can see it in the uh, rolling strikes that have taken place after, uh, after the revolution in Egypt. You can actually see it um, in the vote that was uh, expressed in the first round of the presidential elections in Egypt for Hamdin Sabahi, the left Nasserist candidate, and to a certain extent for uh, Abdul Manam Abu Fatouh, the uh, Islamist, Islamist candidate who had a more revolutionary programme than the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, who also got uh, votes from... Uh, from workers, but particularly Hamdin, Hamdin Sabahi, who got around 5 million votes, which actually expressed, because he stands for, in his social programme, which stood very strongly against privatisation, for defence of the public sector, for defence of welfare, and so on, for a, for a minimum wage, actually expressed the organic politics of the, uh, 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 of the strike wave, and finally broke through, in fact, into an electoral arena, a political, that, that you could, a sense of a mass political voice for, uh, uh, for the working class and, uh, and the poor, or the potential of that, at least. So those elements all come together, as I said, encapsulated by the slogan of uh, the 25th of January, bread, <coughs> freedom and social justice. But that's a very vague and big slogan. It's a slogan that means so many things to so many different people. And you also have to look over the course of the last 18 months at the problem of the separation of the political and the social, which is expressed in so many ways and in so many places. The pendulum swings between street protests, massive rounds of street protests in Egypt, time and time again, and strikes. And it goes very directly. There will be a wave of street protests, and then a wave of strikes, and then another wave of street protests. But no repeat of what we saw in the last week of the 18 days that toppled Mubarak, of the, of the conjuncture of mass strikes and the street protests, that even though most of the strikes that took place in that period didn't expressly have political aims, some of them did. The bus workers, for example, went to Tahrir Square and said, our demands are with, we are with you in Tahrir Square and we're down with the dictatorship and we want a bonus and, and, and better pay. Most of the strikes in that period were actually much more focused around economic demands, but they, they're coming together had an absolutely enormous political effect, and in my view, was the crucial moment in the fall of in, in the fall of in the fall of Mubarak. That has not been repeated during the upsurges of the uh, of massive protests that we've seen since. You can look at the problem of the lack of connection between the demands and the, the demands and slogans in the uh, in in the streets and the workplaces. That there are attempts. Uh, particularly by people on the revolutionary left, the revolutionary socialists, to bring together sets of demands that, that, that bridge the gap between the political and the social, that put together the question of, 
uh, of democratic change with the with, with the question of the minimum of, of the minimum wage that return to the unity of the bread freedom and social and social justice. But actually, this is relatively this is relatively rare. Um, I was in I was in Egypt a few weeks ago during the big upsurge of protests that took place um, in at the beginning of June, and going around the square and on the so I think it was the 5th or the 6th of June, there were tens of thousands of people in the square and hundreds and hundreds of banners. There were very, very few that expressed actual concrete social demands and tried to cross that, uh, tried to bridge that, bridge, that, bridge that gap. The separation of the political and the social gets expressed in the arguments of the, it, within the independent <coughs> trade unions as well, with uh, advanced by the emerging but small bureaucracy at the top of the independent trade unions and the independent union federation, for example. I know this because I spent quite a long time arguing with them about it when I was, when I was there and was told by people uh, like Kamal Abuaito, in fact, who came to Marxism last year and spoke here and, uh, and is a political activist with a very long history of political activism who said, but we can't have political activism within the trade unions. The trade unions are one thing and political activism is another, uh, essentially trying to, trying to build up the, de- the separation between political and, uh, and social souls of the revolution. And in the electoral arena, up until the vote for Hamdi and Sabahi, you, there was this absolutely uh, enormous gap between what the actual demands of the vast majority of ordinary people, particularly the workers' movement, which articulated through the strike demands a very clear, clear anti-neoliberal programme, which demanded permanent contracts for all temporary workers, which demanded a minimum wage, which demanded the return of privatised companies to the public sector, and was actually prepared. People were prepared and struck and occupied their workplaces to do this. That. There was no expression of this whatsoever in any of the programmes of the parties which dominated Parliament, particularly, obviously, the Islamist, uh, the, the Islamist, the Islamist parties, and the uh, uh, and the remnants of the old of the old ruling, the old ruling party. You can see, of course, the separation of the political and the social in other dimensions as well, and the question of uh, and the question of se- uh, uh, of sectarianism, of how working on the question of trying to divide people along, hor- along vertical lines. The ruling class works on the divisions between people on the grounds of, uh, of religion in Egypt, say, whipping up sectarianism against the uh, Coptic Christians and playing on their fears of Islamism in order to try and convince poor Copts to vote for Ahmed Shafiq, the candidate of the counter-revolution. Playing on the question of men versus women, of... Uh, 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 making, making women's bodies one of the front lines of the revolution in terms of the attacks on women in, uh, in the street uh, and so on, and playing on the question of racism. And many of these themes actually play out, I'm talking a lot about Egypt, but many of these themes play out across the, across the region as a whole, particularly the questions of, sec- uh, of sectarianism and the way in which um, the, the idea that, that people have, more, have less in common with each other, with their neighbours and their workmates who happen to be from a different religion or from a, speak a different language than they, the, the, that they have less in common with them than they do with their boss or with the politicians who, who rule them. So we have on the one hand the unity, on the other hand the separation. And it's really important, I think, to understand that these, as I said, are processes that work out through the real lives of real people in real places that they're not something that is confined to textbooks and history books or something that we can simply read off uh, in, in terms of abstract generalisations. That these arguments play out in places like um, the bus garage in Shubra, al uh, Khaimah, North Cairo, uh, Mazalat, which is one of the very important garages in the bus strikes that has taken, that have taken place in Cairo over the last, uh, over the last year, year or so play out at the factory gate in Mahal al Kubra, plays out in the maintenance depot in Cairo Airport, uh, very, very well organised and very well unionised, the, the airport workers in Cairo, plays out in places like Military Factory 99 in Helwan and then the other, uh, other, other factories in the military production sector in Egypt and across the region, a re- region as a whole. So what can we do to understand where this process can go and what the prospects are for the working class realising a role as a revolutionary leader of the people. I said I wanted to come to this question of the idea of a people's, of a people's revolution. 
And I take this from um, a couple of paragraphs in State and Revolution, where Lenin talks about Marx's conception of the, uh, of, the, of the Paris Commune as a real people's revolution. And he gives a couple of reasons for why this is an important conception, which I think are quite relevant to understanding the potential for, uh, for the revolutions in the, in the Arab world and some of the, some, uh, of the important dimensions of it. He talks about, he says, you know, it might seem strange, Marx talking about the idea of a people's revolution, the ideas of a people's revolution. Um, but what he says, he looks at the example of the Portuguese and the Turkish revolutions in the early 20th century. He says, we have to admit both of these are bourgeois revolutions. Neither of them, however, is a people's revolution, inasmuch as in neither does the mass of the people with its own economic and political demands to any noticeable degree, come out actively and independently. On the contrary, although the Russian bourgeois revolution of 1905 to 1907 displayed no such brilliant successes as t- at times fell to the lot of the Portuguese and Turkish revolutions, he's thinking about actual, uh, the, the success of the officers in Turkey in, uh, in the Turkish revolution uh, <laughs> taking power and so on. It was undoubtedly a real people's revolution since the mass of the people, its majority, the very lowest social strata, crushed by oppression and exploitation, rose independently and placed on the entire course of the revolution the impress of their own demands, of their attempts to build in their own way a new society in the place of the old society that was being destroyed. Now, why is this important? He said, well, actually... In Europe, in 1871, there was not a single country on the continent in which the proletariat constituted the majority of the people. A people's revolution, one that actually swept the majority into its stream, could only be such if it embraced the proletariat and the peasantry. These two classes then constituted the people. The two classes are united by the fact that the bureaucratic and military state machine oppresses, crushes and exploits them. To smash this machine, to break it up, this is truly in the interests of the people, of the majority, of the workers and most of the peasants. This is the preliminary condition of a free alliance of the poorest peasants and the proletarians. Whereas without such an alliance, democracy is unstable and socialist transformation impossible. Now I find these ideas actually very rich potentially for our understanding of the the revolutions that are unfolding in the Arab world at the moment. Because as I said, in terms of the unity from above, the political and the social, united in the op- operations of the state, which is, of course, it's a, rep- it's, it, it's a crucible of contending and contradictory class forces, but it's a class state. It's a state that's not at ours. It's the state of the people who oppress us and exploit us. And that you can see very directly how, this, how breaking this state is an absolutely central condition for the revolution achieving the demands of bread, freedom and social justice for the vast majority of people. That any attempt to limit it to some kind of uh, uh, simple widening of the political space in terms of allowing mo- new mainstream parties to, um, uh, to, 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 to become you know, partners in power in seats in the government and, and seats in parliament will not satisfy and cannot satisfy the needs and aspirations of the vast hundreds of thousands, in fact millions of people who took part, who took part in, in the revolution. But equally, if the driving force of that process is to be the working class, you have to take account of the fact that this is a society in which organised workers are a minority. They're a big, big minority. There's a massive process of urbanisation um, that, that is still continuing across the Middle East. But it is, not the tr- it, is not, it is not true that everybody in the Egyptian working class works in a workplace where there is a large number of people or even have... Uh, uh, many, many people work in many kinds of precarious and un- unstable kinds of employment. And there are hundreds and millions of people who work, in the, who, who, who work in very different kind of jobs, who work in the countryside, who are part of the poor and the oppressed, who are broken and crushed by the state, though the state of tyranny that exists in Egypt, that's the state of the old regime, who have every interest in completing the revolution, but who must be brought into unity and to work with and under the leadership of the working class in order to achieve that. And of course, the other side of that is if that they don't, then these people can be won for the counter-revolution. They can either sit out and watch, the crush, watch while the working class is crushed, 
or they can actually actively be pulled into the other direction. The small people who are small artisans, for example, working in tiny workshops. Um, you know, for example, the uh, furniture makers in Damietta, they have an independent union, and I met, I met some of them. Uh, actually, they have a lot of people in their independent union. Um, and they are affiliated to the Independent Federation of Trade Unions. People who work in those kind of jobs, who are small journeymen and craftsmen, can easily be pulled in the other direction. They're, they can they can be made to feel that the revolution is something that endangers their livelihood. Or if you take the very real danger of the difference in terms of the of what's going on in the con- uh, in the countryside in in Egypt, of the way in which the revolution is much more advanced in the urban areas in terms of winning vast majority, large numbers of people towards the uh, to to towards deepening and completing the revolution. And even in the urban areas as well, you have to say that this is a process that is still at play and that that can easily be turned back. The constant crises, for example, over the um, lack of access to cooking gas, uh, of uh, of, uh, problems with food prices, of the sense of insecurity, um, of... uh, uh, and so on and so forth, are all used to play on people's mind and, and to break apart that possible unity, that potential and incredibly powerful unity from below. So I think that this idea of seeing the role of the working class within the concept of a real people's revolution is very, very important and very rich for what we want to, uh, how we want to see the revolutionary process <laughs> develop. And as I said before, one of the key points about this is that in Lenin's idea, he didn't just talk about this at the level of balance of forces in terms of the states. This was also based on an understanding that you had to build organisation that required, as I said, a special kind of people, tribunes of the people, he called them, uh, revolutionary leaders of the people against the bourgeoisie. There's a very famous passage from what is, to be, what is to be Done, where he talks about the social democrats' ideal, by which he means a revolutionary socialist. Social democracy at that point didn't have quite the, the bad name that it does at the moment. The social democrats' ideal should not be the trade union secretary, but the tribune of the people, who is able to react to every manifestation of tyranny and oppression, no matter where it appears no matter what stratum or class of the people it affects, who is able to generalise these manifestations and produce a single picture of police violence and capitalist exploitation, who is able to take advantage of every event, however small, in order to set before all his socialist convictions and his democratic demands, in order to clarify for all and everyone the world historic significance of the struggle for the emancipation of the proletariat. And we can see, if we come back to the question of the separation of the economic and political, we can see how this is absolutely vital to the development of the revolutions in the, in the Middle East. That actually, if you look at, for example, the unfolding process in Sudan at the moment, where there is revolutionary movement is starting to, is starting to develop, thousands of people have been involved in protests against austerity, um, but also then moving very quickly to demands for the fall of the dictatorship using the same slogans as in, uh, as in Cairo, Shab, Yuri, Descartes and Nizam. They were actually chanting this down Whitehall um, last Saturday because there was a hunt demonstration by hundreds of, of Sudanese activists um, here in London. But if at the heart of this, firstly, there is not the working class as an organised force, And secondly, if within the working class there are not people who will also stand up and say that I stand with the refugees in the Nubian mountains, that I stand against genocide in Darfur, that I stand for the self-determination of people in the South Sudan if they want it, and does not understand that the way in which the regime in Sudan works is that by it unites... It has the potential to unite people by its operation of both oppression and exploitation against them on all these levels, but that can also divide them. So, for example, the slogans on the demonstration on on last Saturday also included people calling for the UK to intervene and, and, and international protection. And a whole vista of the of the trap that people can be sucked into if you're in if you're a minority, if you're facing national oppression within the context of a particular country that you can think that imperialist powers can come and help and support you. If you take the question of Syria, you can see very, very, very acutely the same issue and the same, and the same dynamic. And you can see it, I think, in Egypt, the absolute necessity of having people in those places that I mentioned 
in the garage in Shubra, Mazalat, in Military Factory 99 in Helwan, at the Gate of Mahalla, in all of those places, who will unite in their own persons and argue and put forward demands and action that unite the political and the social. This has to, of course, take, advan- bal- take account of the actual balance of class, of class forces. And that we have to understand that revolution is not a smooth process that goes onwards and upwards. In the case of, in the case of Egypt, I think it's been clear for several months that the counter-revolution has been gaining in strength, that it has gained a good deal more control over the repressive apparatus of the state, that the process of the uh, tut here, the process of cleansing the state from, from, from below, had run into the sand effectively, although strikes and protests continue to raise these, raise these demands. Uh, it has obviously to be renewed. It must be renewed from below and deepened if, there is, uh, if there's to be any progress. And if you look at, for example, the votes that um, Ahmed Shafiq, the uh, defeated candidate for the counter-revolution, got in the, in the elections, you can actually also see an expression uh, of this. Firstly, the confidence that, uh, that the generals had in putting Shafiq forward as a candidate. Uh, I mean, previously, people had just thought he was a joke. Uh, most of the jokes that he was Mubarak's last prime minister um, was got rid of in, in March 2000 and 2011 and, and was primarily remembered up until fairly recently for his terrible taste in jumpers. <laughs> there was a joke about Ahmed Shafiq's knitwear that was circulating at the time. Actually, no, this man who was very directly and very openly the figure of the old regime, that he could be put into the second round of the presidential elections, uh, and that actually he could win votes. He took first place in Mahal and Kubra. Uh, there was, okay, there's a 50% turnout. Maybe most of the class conscious workers in Mahal and the factory didn't vote for him. Hopefully not. But at any rate, he won Mahal and Kubra. He won uh, also a number of other in, important industrial areas. He didn't win Helwan, didn't win in everywhere, didn't win in Alexandria. But you can see the, 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 the balance of forces is something that means that we have to take account of that and have to understand the need and the time that it takes in order to build organisation, which means saying that there is no arena of struggle that is closed, that there has to be a fight at every level. And I think, just to finish, that we have to remember really what is at stake. I mean, you might ask, why, why am I standing up talking about this? I'm not Egyptian. Um, and I'm not from the Middle East, why does it matter to me and why does it matter to us? I would say absolutely it matters to us because these are the debates of the era. We live in an era of mass strikes, of of revolutions, of mass protests. We know without a doubt, we have seen with our own eyes and participated ourselves in protests and strikes and revolutions that show that the mass of ordinary people will fight and resist, that they will resist the attempt to make them pay for the crisis. They will resist the rule of the bankers. They will resist the rule of the 1%. But it isn't enough. That's the problem. It isn't enough to occupy the squares. It isn't enough to have trade union leaders call 2 million, 2.5 million workers out on strike. I used to get very, get very frustrated about the, um, when I talked to uh, colleagues in the independent unions in, in, in Egypt, they go, you had two and a half million people out on strike on one day and you didn't have a revolution. What are you thinking of? <laughs> but, we have to understand, of course, there are differences in these pro- how these processes unfold, that mass strikes in Egypt and mass strikes here and mass strikes in Greece are not the same. The occupation, movement of occupations and squares in, in Cairo and London is not necessarily the same either. But what it all comes back to, though, is the question of, I think, of what we can do about it, of the question of revolutionary organisation. That one thing that we know for certain that makes a difference in all these places is revolutionary socialist organisation. That, as I said, is about those people who unite the political and the social in everything they do in every area of their lives, and will always stand there. I am personally very proud to be part of a revolutionary socialist tradition that can put these arguments at the factory gate in Mahalla, and at Westbourne Park Garage, and in the streets of Quebec, and wherever else it is. I'm very proud of that, because I think it makes a huge difference to how we see this era. Is it something that is going to end up in a failed a mess of failed revolutions and and broken hopes, or is it something that actually opens the door to the real liberation and transformation of humanity? 
I'm proud to be a member of that tradition. If you're not already, I'd ask you, please join us. Thanks very much. I'm Lynn Secker from Jews for Justice for Palestinians and was captain of the Jewish boat to Gaza three months after the Marmara. Mm -hmm. There's an old socialist I'm speaking here uh, in a personal capacity. Um, I just first of all want to thank uh, Anne for, the, uh, uh, for her talk and for her uh, great article in, the, um, in, in, in uh, International Socialism, which she wrote a while ago about uh, Egypt. What I'd like to uh, point out is that uh, the centrality of the Palestinian cause throughout the Middle East. There was this fantastic banner, I think it was in Tunisia, which uh, was held up, which said, um, bread is our red line, beware our hunger and our anger. Now that's taken from Mahmoud Darwish's last line of the poem, I am a Palestinian. Uh, it's central consciousness throughout the, the, the Middle East. But the Palestinian uh, uh, fight for justice uh, and dignity and freedom uh, is actually uh, not possible to be won until uh, in, on, in and on itself. It's only through the working class organisations around the Middle East, and particularly as I understand it, that of the, uh, the Egyptian working class, particularly as uh, many of the places they're employed in are, are owned by the generals. So you have this direct confrontation between the working class organisation in Egypt and the military state, state structure and the neoliberal uh, imperialism, the neoliberalism which has uh, got this uh, incredible grip which Adam Haney, who's speaking here later, uh, describes so thoroughly. So my question to, uh, uh, to Anne is, can you give us some more information about the current situation, activities and organisation of the Egyptian working class? Uh, what's, what's happening now? What was happening when the, uh, the generals suddenly abolished all the uh, moves, the, the, the progressive moves towards democracy, the abolition of parliament, the take back the writing of the constitution and so on? Um, and uh, following on from that, would you describe it? We're entering a situation of dual power, in uh, particularly in Egypt. It's very difficult because dual power in different periods of history, different circumstances, uh, differ very much, and it's very difficult to uh, to refine it. Thank you very much. This forum is about all well, workers in Egypt, and I think it's very important to fight for workers' revolution. I think it's very important not to support any capitalist parties. And I don't think that the working class in Egypt's only option is to vote for one or another uh, capitalist party, either the remnants of the Mubarak regime, or uh, to support uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, or even the Nasserahs. The Muslim Brotherhood is a bourgeois organization that represents a deadly danger to workers, to Coptic Christians, to women, to gays, and also to uh, the SWP's very own comrades, uh, who the Brotherhood um, has actually threatened. Now, before Egyptian parliament was liquidated, the Brotherhood MP MPs, a number of them, supported a bill to legalize female genital mutilation. In a June uh, 16th article written by Anne Alexander, she said, Voting for Morsi against Shafi is an important step in building a revolutionary movement beyond the elections. It is. No, it isn't. It is. Telling workers to vote Morsi is a step towards making sure that workers' revolution to overthrow capitalism never happens. In Egypt, basic democratic freedoms, land to the peasants, women's freedom, national emancipation from under the thumb of U.S. imperialism cannot be achieved by the national bourgeoisie. This task can only be resolved by the working class acting as a class for itself, independently and in opposition to
to all these bourgeois forces. That is the essence of permanent revolution. And you need a revolutionary workers' party that will not capitulate to the Brotherhood or to the Nazarites um, to lead the proletariat in making that revolution. And um, if you'd like to know more about this, you should read Workers' Hammer. <laughs> Um, for the for the talk, and I wish every talk about Egypt and about the revolution would be based on the same level of study and information, because many times we just hear a lot of comments, and we wonder on which basis they are formed and by what analysis they are formed. Thank you, Anne, for that. I think it's a good step to go forward in our analysis. Uh, I really would like to connect to what you mentioned in a passage of your talk. And uh, much of the analysis where, that we can read in non-mainstream newspapers and socialist workers or other socialist newspapers are generally focused on uh, the struggles that are taking in urban areas and that are taking place in, uh, in factories or independent trade unions. So let's say, about the more organized labor in Egypt. Uh, my question is really about, it's probably connected to some, a, a very old question which was brought forward mainly by Engels and is the peasant question. Uh, my question is, is, uh, is to ask you or some other in the audience, what is the level of connection that exists between these organized labor and the working class organizations that are active in the Egyptian revolution and the unorganized labor in the rural areas as well in, as in urban areas, in suburbs or uh, other areas. Because as you say, the, like in, the, in, the, in the decade that preceded uh, the Egyptian revolution, or what we know like the 25th of January revolution. There has been harsh struggles, even in the countryside, there were more, there were less organized, more direct action, less formal in some sense. And even like in the wake of the revolution, there has been like uh, occupations of land and direct actions, and there has been harsh repression, much harsher than what we normally see happening in towns, so you can't believe how harsh it is. And so, not, please. Yeah. so really like the question is, uh, what is the level of uh, knowledge that exists among the more informed urban activists of the situation that is of the rural working classes and the informal proletariat in suburbs? And what is the level of exchange and penetration by the organized labor and organized organization in these areas that are crucial to complete the revolution? Thank you. Uh, just first on the previous speaker, not this one, the one coming from the Workers' Hammer, Spartacus Group, I think uh, I, I think we could dispose of it quite easily. Uh, Engels said an election is a barometer of the maturity of the working class and not much more than that. And that's a good helpful place to start. Secondly, in a revolution, as Trotsky said, it proceeds by one step forward, two steps backward and often the other way round too. It's not a smooth linear event. Uh, and a massive process is happening here. What, what the comrade doesn't seem to understand at all is the level of oppression and sheer grinding misery that the women and the people of the second and third worlds have, have been under for so long that actually a vote for the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the product of the liberating process of the revolution so far, is progressive. That's why it's better than voting for, obviously, the, the generals. And of course, and of course the Muslim Brotherhood's a bloody nasty organisation. Of course it's got some horrendous beliefs and we're absolutely against the ones she specified. It's absolutely disgusting, horrible thing. And we, the revolutionary working class, will wipe it off the planet. 
But you understand the process happens in, not stages, I'm, I'm not going down the Communist Party road, but it's, it's a process of steps forward and backward. And the working class has to learn itself because only the working class can make the revolution, not some pontificating <laughs> academic from America. No, no. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne, for the fantastic articles you've been writing all this time. By far, peerless above the rubbish that everybody else is writing about Egypt and the Minnow Revolution. <laughs> Secondly, yes. she's covered what I think is that contradictory dialectical element of revolution, which of course in, involves dealing with the shit of the past, right? Mark said, you know, uh, the weight of all dead generations weighs on the, the brain of the living like a nightmare. And of course, that's the process that the revolution is clearing out of the world. This has started. This is the 21st century workers' revolution, if we make it so. And for that reason, I want to dwell on what I think are some of the best bits. First of all, the revolution is so uneven and so combined, like society itself, that you have colossal heights being scaled. Very little coverage was given to it in this country or in any of the press, even on the left. But there was a published, uh, public release from the, the 17 occupied steel plants by the steel workers just a few weeks after the revolution. It made it through the internet, I found it two or three places, truncated or full. It's an absolutely magnificent statement, and it says it calls on the whole of the Egyptian working class to occupy their factories, take control, boot out all the Mubarakite managers, elect their own committees, and then, in this order, I love the way they do it, the workers to take over, A, production, B, distribution. C, pricing for wages. That's a very good idea of what work is going to do in the future. <laughs> that is the way forward. And we revolutionaries, not like the CPGB in 1926, don't dwell on how bloody wonderful the TUC General Council or so what is. We dwell on, look at the steel workers in Egypt. That is the way we're going. That is the way Lenin took the party in the class in 1917 in October. He got told by the workers, we want to take over the factories, Lenin. We've got, we've got a slogan called workers' control, and Lenin wrote down, it's a novel idea. <laughs> and of course, that. Same in 1905, who taught Lenin about the Soviets? Workers' councils. Because that comes that steel workers' occupation. Read that press release if you can get hold of it. It is an embryonic workers' council, so in the strict sense. Lovely, I'll leave it there. Uh, yeah, thank you for the very interesting uh, introduction. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, when I talk with people about uh, the Arab revolutions, uh, right now people say, okay, it was a nice idea, but it turned out to be a mess. And um, I absolutely think that is not, uh, that is not true, uh, though there are many uh, dangers to, uh, to the revolution, just like, like uh, counter-revolution uh, and um, intervention. Uh, which uh, we, must op uh, we must oppose, of course. Um, uh, I uh, had two questions. Um, first is on Egypt, you uh, talked about the, um, uh, the vision of uh, social and political uh, action. Uh, do you think there are perspectives uh, for another uh, conjunction of the uh, two of these uh, sorts of, uh, of struggle? And the second one is when it comes to the role of the working class in a country like uh, Libya, for example. Um, uh, you know, what's happening in Libya at the moment is pre uh, presented as a, um, like a fight between, on the one hand, Gaddafi's troops, on the other hand, uh, the Western uh, troops. But uh, is the uh, working class still um, an active force in, uh, in Libya? And how do you, uh, how do you see that? Thank you. Just have one quick question. Um, do you think that a split between uh, the military intelligence officers and SCAF is on the cards anytime soon? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, first, um, I would like to thank Anne and the SWP for all the real solidarity work they've been doing on behalf of the Egyptian movement. Uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, and it's the kind of solidarity work that actually respects those who work on the ground. And when Anne writes about something or talks about something, she does really invest effort, knowing her personally, into coming to Egypt, visiting us, seeing the situation on the ground, visiting the factories. Unlike cyber anarchists and some sectarian Trotskyists who have been giving us advice over the past two years, every single person who gets online, you do this. You should do that. How can you do this? You should do. It. I mean, like, 
okay, we'll come to Egypt, please, or do the revolution in your own country, and then we can, you know, talk about it. Now, and now let's talk about the more serious stuff, and, and I want to like tackle here the point of the separation between what's economic and what's political, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, please put into consideration the fact that Egypt, up until only last month, officially at least, we've been living under emergency law, which bans the assembly of five people together. So when 27,000 workers at Ghazd al-Mahalla decide to get together to go on strike over bread and butter issues, that's a political decision. It's not really that economic. When 27,000 workers decide to get together in order to strike over a 10-minute break, okay, which is an economic demand, but knowing that state security police will be outside their factory, knowing that the central security forces will be outside their factory, knowing that now the military police will be outside their factory, waiting to intervene to smash the strike or arrest the strike leaders and torture them, that's a political decision. Uh, moreover, in some of the sectors that Anne also I mean, touched upon, and these are the sectors that are highly militarized, militarized in terms of the management. Uh, in Egypt, the army controls roughly 25% of the economy, and many of the retired generals and the retired officers, as a way to reward them, they are given public sector companies to run, they are given more or less like even private businesses, you know, I mean, to run. So the amount of control that the army has over the economy in Egypt is actually much bigger than one can imagine. And in some of those strikes that we've been witnessing recently, especially in the ports, whether it's airports, or the harbors in Suez, Ain Sofna, and the others, there were clear demands for the demilitarization of the management. And in the protests and the clashes that did take place on several occasions, there were outright calls for down with the junta. Now, the, work, the, the consciousness of the working class is uneven. So of course, I mean, there are sectors that are very progressive, and they don't have any sort of illusions whatsoever about the military. And there are sectors that are in the back. And it's the job of the revolutionary organization, more or less, is to link, you know, I mean, those hot spots and those uh, places where there are industrial actions with the most militant leaders. And at the same time, comrade, and I would like to finish up with this point, I mean, the comrade before me was, uh, was talking about how the Arab Spring turned into a mess. Well, actually, it is a mess. I mean, at the moment, of course we're in a mess. <laughs> I mean, there's no question that we're in a mess. But at the same time, the thing is, I mean, did you really believe that the revolution would be settled in 18 days? <laughs> I mean, like, excuse me, I mean, any revolution in the world, it will take several years. It will take several years. And in those several years, you can never expect some linear curve of victories. We'll go through ups and downs, victories and defeats. And just prior to the elections, prior, you know, I mean, when everybody was that sure that Shafi was going to uh, uh, be crowned as our next president, definitely we were in a downturn. There were no strikes. Everybody was demoralized. Everybody, you know, I mean, was depressed. Revolutionary activists were already starting, like, you know, I mean, to dig the trenches. Others were, like, you know, I mean, looking into escaping from the country. But now we got Morsi, a reactionary, an opportunist, a reformist, just like your Labour Party actually here. There is a more or less. But at the same time, the bulk of this organization, the bulk of this organization constitutes of young students, lower middle class professionals, workers, some farmers those who have illusions about Morsi. When Morsi talks about the application of the Islamic Sharia, of course he has neoliberal programs in his head. But when the worker who is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and he's a follower of Morsi, talks about Islamic Sharia, he's thinking social justice. He's not thinking neoliberalism. And as soon as, as, soon as Morsi was crowned in the presidential palace, I don't know if you're following the news or not. I mean, the presidential palace is being besieged by labor protests at the moment. And actually, this was one of the reasons that more or less like stalled, you know, I mean, our coming here because we were not sure, I don't know, whether we can leave Egypt at the moment or not. Every single person with a problem in this country is now descending on Morsi. Is now descending on Morsi. The organization is going to crank soon. And that's the best thing ever, you know, that I think it happened to us. here today because of the inspiration that the Egyptian comrades have made of the revolution and the impact it's had 
in the Middle East and beyond. And I think it's an inspiration on many different levels. If you think about the, the decades of defeat and retreat that we've faced in the West, the argument that the working class is, you know, is finished, they've punctured those kind of ideas. The fact that the working class were central to the revolution in Egypt and in Tunisia. But also, I think our party, our tradition has been arguing for decades that the road to liberation in Palestine and the rest of the Middle East lies through Cairo, through worker struggle in Egypt, the biggest working class in the Middle East. And again, it vindicates that. You can already see the pressure that, uh, that, that it's created in the Egyptian government over the situation in Gaza. And also, I think, when you look at the way that the Egyptian working class have transcended all the divisions, divisions we have in our own class as well, religious, gender, precarious and less precarious workers, public sector, private sector, you see all those divisions being overcome in quite, in quite a phenomenal way. And for me, that's one of the, the more interesting aspects of the revolution, because in the West, we face this argument that we're all precarious now, and of course, there are, there are problems with the, the rise of precarious labour and the like, but when I found out that in Egypt one of the major demands was for a contract, and I thought that these people have had a revolution, and we are told that precarious workers are victims, and these workers have just kicked out one of the worst dictators in the world, it gives you an idea of the power of workers, precarious and non-precarious, in quite a, a, a way that's completely unexpected. But what I want to talk about is what we can do. I mean, it's, it's great being here and listening to the fantastic speeches, but we have to work out how we deepen the process. And Anne's been doing a lot of work around the MENA Solidarity Network, and we have to work out how, how we can bring further solidarity, how we can build the confidence of the people who are in the middle of this revolutionary revolt in Egypt and beyond. And the MENA Solidarity Network seeks to build relationships with rank and file workers here in Britain and in Egypt, Tunisia, Bahrain and beyond. And you can't, you can't overstate the importance of the work that's been done by the MENA network. I mean, I work in the, in, in the aerospace industry and Anne asked me to, if we could get some solidarity greetings to the, the workers in the defence industry in, uh, in, in Egypt. And I, I was horrified when I found out that, as the previous speaker said, the factories are run by the generals and they have military law in the factories, and any transgressions are punishable by sometimes the threat of death. Now, these workers were central to the revolution. The defence workers were a key part in stopping, stopping the profits going to the generals and forcing them to, to kick out Mubarak, and they were a central part of that process. And when we sent our message of solidarity, Anne says that it was circulated to the workers, it was put up on public display, they gained huge inspiration the solidarity greetings. Now I know we send solidarity greetings to workers in Britain when they're on, on strike and the like, but when you send solidarity greetings to Egyptian workers, it has huge significance. And so we have to work out how we get more solidarity, not just messages of support, but solidarity by delegations visiting over there and bringing Egyptian workers over here. Because one of the crucial things about MENA is that it brings Egyptian workers over here. If you think about the J30 strike last year, we had the president of the Tax Collectors Union over in London visiting picket lines, PCS picket lines, making that solidarity two-way. And that's something that only MENA does. On May the 10th, when health workers were on strike in Britain, we had messages of support for Egyptian health workers on the picket lines of health workers. And on the London bus workers strike just last week, again, bus workers for Cairo, message of support on the London picket lines. And, and the significance of that, when you've got a large number of London bus workers come from Africa. It had a real connection. So MENA is a, is a key to us building that solidarity and I would urge you to pick up a leaflet and raise it to your union branch, your reps committee and your regional committees when you get back. My name is, my name is Tafaz Bachoto. I'm from the International Socialist Organization of Zimbabwe. Last year, okay. On the 19th of February, uh, myself together with 44 others were arrested for organizing a meeting discussing events that had taken place in Egypt and Tunisia and the lessons that could be learned for Africa and especially for Zimbabwe, given that we're going through a period of writing a new constitution. 39 others were later released. 
uh, myself and other five comrades were initially charged with treason and then later on subverting constitutional government, treason carried a death sentence, subverting constitutional government, 10 years in prison. But together with the mobilization that was done on the ground, it then forced the government, the charges were later reduced to inciting to commit public violence. And in March this year, uh, the six of us were convicted of inciting to commit public violence. We're made to pay a fine of $500 to perform 420 hours of community service and two years were suspended. We have since challenged against this conviction and currently uh, the community service was suspended. But the government, the regime, the Mugabe's regime did all this because when the revolts in Egypt and Tunisia started, they panicked because we have also had someone who has been in power for long and implementing austerity measures. Our arrest was only to send a message to the ordinary people of Zimbabwe, not today challenge the current system, the ruling government, and the capitalist system. But as I stand here today, I'm excited that that did not happen. On the, on the 29th of February, while it's were in court, we're being tried. Uh, the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Union organized workers from the government sector and the private sector, and they were on the streets demanding a living wage. And these demonstrations have since grown monthly. And um, last month, the Minister of Finance, upon advice from the uh, from IMF, uh, announced that there was going to be a wage freeze on salaries. And the workers are coming, they're actually planning a big demonstration together with the private sectors. And the interesting thing, the exciting thing is that it's not only us, the socialists, who are saying that there is money, but because of what has happened uh, <coughs> some four or five years ago, Zimbabwe discovered that it has got huge amounts of diamonds. But up to now, these diamonds have been sold. No money is going to public sector. No money is going to education or health. The workers are now demanding that they need part of this um, money, not just to build uh, the military schools or for the ministers to benefit. Because the Minister of Mines actually recently bought a bank that had collapsed, yet is a civil servant. So the questions are, where is he getting all this money from? So the events that took place in, 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 uh, in Egypt, uh, drew quite a lot of inspiration for, uh, for us as Zimbabweans. And as a socialist revolution, just like the comrades did in, in Egypt, will be uh, urging people next year to vote for MDC. Though it supports uh, neoliberal policies, the people here in Mugabe with so much anger will be asking them to vote for MDC, but also highlighting the dangers of MDC, the neoliberal policies that the MDC will implement, and there are so much potentials for the Zimbabwean revolution. Thank you. And, um I mean, the, uh, I, will, I will address the question around the, the issue of the Muslim Brotherhood, but I would say there is going to be another meeting, a very important meeting about the uh, Islamist movements and uh, the lessons of the experience of the Arab revolutions that's going to take place later this afternoon where this discussion can, can continue. Um, I mean, I, just a couple, of, a couple of points in relation to some of the, the concrete questions. Um, Somebody asked about the question of Libya and the role that the working class has played there. I mean, I, I'm afraid I haven't been following details of what's been happening in Libya a, a lot. And as far as I'm aware, there isn't been a great deal of, of role played by uh, workers as a kind of independent force. But one of the things that, that has happened is that um, the kind of contradiction between some of the expectations that people have had, even given the NATO intervention and the attempt and the, the taking over of the revolution, if you like, from uh, from above and from outside, um, that doesn't mean that the social struggle is not a route back potentially into raising some of the same contradictions that I've that I've talked about. That uh, the vast majority of people in in Libya have absolutely no interest in seeing a revolution that only brings into power uh, you know, people who will continue with the same economic and social policies uh, that, uh, that both Western, Western governments and, uh, and their, own, uh, their own ruling class want to see. Um, on the question, the very important question around the Egyptian presidential elections, I mean, I absolutely agree, of course, with the point about the, uh, the, the question of in a contest between Morsi and Shafiq in the second round, who do you who do you vote for? That's why I argued that uh, at that particular point, a vote for Morsi 
I thought was an important thing to do in order to say that there has to be a strategy beyond the, the moment of the, uh, of the elections. And that the importance of that, though, has to be put in the context of understanding the importance of the first round vote. Yes, it is... In a, it, what we saw in the, uh, in, in the second round was that millions of ordinary people in Egypt have enough faith in the revolution to want to continue. They can see that Shafiq represents the reinvention of the old regime and an absolute disaster for people, the vast majority of ordinary people in, uh, in Egypt. But it's also really important not to forget what happened in the first round and the size of the vote. The fact, actually, that Morsi got around 5 million votes in the first round and only just scraped ahead of, of, of Shafiq, but that the combined vote for Hamdi and Sabahi and Abu, uh, Abdul Manam Abu Fatuh, who came third and fourth respectively, was much bigger than uh, either Shafiq's or, 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 or Morsi's vote. And particularly the significance of Hamdi and Sabahi's vote as an expression of a, a, a actually a secular um, politics that says we don't want to continue with neoliberalism and we don't we want to continue with the revolution there are some there are quite a lot of problems with some of Hamdine's positions in relation to the army he's a Nasserist after all he does have and he and after the um, uh, uh, after the, the second round the, in the run-up to the second round of the um, of the elections when the military was making moves in terms of dissolving the parliament and so on he actually made some statements which were very problematic essentially saying this is okay because uh, it, it's benefiting people who are not in the Islamist-dominated parliament. I think that's a complete mistake, and that anyone on the liberals or the left side who says that is also playing into the trap of uh, the, the, the military council is setting, is setting around it. What the, the difficult thing is that seeing both the opportunities and the, and the potential of the breakdown of trust in the Islamists is on, on a, a very, very deep level. If you look at uh, Hamdin Sabahi's vote in Alexandria, he took Alexandria. Alexandria was practically declaring you know, independence from Egypt. It was saying it was when I was there. That, mm, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets celebrating the fact it was capital of the revolution because neither, I mean, Morsi, I think, came third um, and Shafiq came nowhere. In, in Alexandria in the first round. But this was a city which has been a base for the Muslim Brotherhood and for the Salafists and for other Islamist groups for a very long time, that they swept the board in the parliamentary elections. You have, an, you have a breakdown of illusions and trust in, the, um, in, in the, the main reformist forces in the Egyptian political scene, i.e. The, the Islamists. And that, um, the, the fact that, that there is an expression of that going in, uh, in the direction of the kind of politics that Hamdi and Sabahi represents is a, positive, is a positive thing. And that that's something that has to absolutely be built on. Uh, there is no question that you have to, you have to, you, you have to take the positive out of, that, out of that situation. But on the other hand, you have to see it in the context of where the, the balance of forces is in relation to the state as a whole. That actually the state machinery, the deep heart of the state, the iron core of the state, as, uh, the iron heart of the state, as Sam Hedegui calls it, um, is still there. It's still in charge. It is the same generals that Mubarak appointed. They haven't broken. They haven't broken down. The army is still intact. The repressive apparatus of the state is still basically intact, despite m efforts from outside through massive protests and beating the beating it down from outside. It still hasn't it hasn't broken down. It is still the same. There's still the same state. You could say, in a sense, that the the people changed, but the state has not changed, and this is the core of the the core of the problem. So, therefore, I mean, uh, in terms of the question about whether the military intelligence officers and SCAF are about to split, I'm afraid I don't not really privy to this kind of information, not knowing anyone on SCAF personally or anyone in military intelligence. Um, yes, there are. There, there, you, you can never know when there will be fractures, particularly in a revolutionary situation, when you. When the state apparatus is damaged and beaten from outside in the way it is, yes, things can happen and you should be ready to move if it does. But I don't think you can bet on that as being the, the point on which you base your revolutionary strategy. On the question of dual power, I think we have to be really clear about that. No, there is not a situation of dual power in Egypt, unfortunately. I wish there were, but there are no organs of dual power that I can see that are able to do the kind of things. Or uh, there are, you can see the build, where the building blocks of them would come from, and this is a lot of the stuff that I've written about in, in, in recent in recent months because I think it's absolutely fundamentally important to understand 
that the debates and arguments about workers' control in workplaces across Egypt and the things that they've done, kicking out their bosses, even if it's only on a very temporary basis during a, during a strike, they are part of the heritage that is the same heritage that, out of which came the Soviets in Russia, out of which came workers' councils in 1956 in, in Hungary, out of which came workers' councils and commissions in, 1970, in the 1974 revolution in Portugal, out of which came the Interfactory Strike Committees in Poland in 1980. The list goes on and on. This is not separate. There is, this is part of the same process, but it is not yet organs of dual power. And if we kind of overplay that and make it into organisation and a degree of, of political organisation and consciousness that it isn't, then there is a real danger that we will miss the rise of the counter-revolution on the other side and, and, and not see the shifting balance of, of forces and how it, needs to be, how it needs to be acted on. Because you can't make workers' councils in an abstract. You can't wish them out of, uh, out of thin air. You have to work in your everyday practice to build on the basic principles on which these things are worked. For, so, for example, strike organisation in Egypt is extremely democratic. Uh, it involves the election of strike, com of strike committees, which function a lot, you know, the same principles as, work as workers' councils. But it, in order to get to be a situation where you're really talking about dual power, it has to go a lot further. I think that everything that should, everything should be bent towards trying to make that happen. But again, this comes to the question of the, uh, of the unity between the political and the social in everyday practice. And this brings me really to the last couple of points, which is the one about solidarity. Um, because I'm, I, I'd like to thank Hossam for what he, what he said about the work that we're doing. I mean, really, it is very small, absolutely incredibly small, compared to the things that they're facing and compared to the dangers that they're in. The kind of, the, the, you know, the task, that, the task that we set ourselves in terms of sending messages of support or raising debates or organising delegations is minuscule compared to the, uh, the, the heroic work that comrades are carrying out there. But actually I'm also more interested in a way about what the practice of solidarity with Egypt and with, uh, with Egyptian workers and workers across the Middle East means for us. Because it, for us, it's about breaking down the separation between the political and the social. It's about saying to workers in your own workplace, yes, we need a revolution. Yes, if people could stand in the sh streets of Cairo in front of tanks, yes, you can come and stand on the picket line. Nobody is going to turn up with a tank to oppress you if you go to the picket line. You can use these concrete stories to inspire people and to drive that through in the arguments that you have in, everyday, uh, in the everyday struggles. And, and really just to reiterate, I guess, the point about what, what we need to build out of this. Because, you know, as I said, I think that these, these questions are ones that are being played out on a, on a global level. There is a whole generation of people who are coming into struggle at a time of mass strikes, of revolutions, of protests on an absolutely enormous scale. And that what we need to pull out of that is more revolutionary socialist organisation. I'd like, to just, I'd like to just finish, actually, with a quote from a meeting that um, Sam Nagib did uh, a few weeks ago. He's the author of the pamphlet that you can see there, which I encourage you to buy. It was written a year ago, um, and he's a leading activist in the Revolutionary Socialist. He is actually also one of the people who has been directly under fire from the Muslim Brotherhood and from the state. People from the Muslim Brotherhood put in complaints against him to the military prosecutor saying he was going to burn public buildings down. These cases are still live. They're being investigated by the military judges at the moment. So, and he is absolutely and utterly clear about you have to stand on the right side of the barricades with the Brotherhood against the generals when it matters. And the meeting, that he talk, the, the meeting that he gave on the 20th of June, this is in between the, uh, the actual vote taking place and the announcement of the, of the result. And I think it's, uh, I think it's very, I, I, I think it's very important um, to understand, you know, as I said, what people are facing in Egypt and when they, when they make these arguments and make these discussions is something that, uh, that, that, that we have to get our, our heads around why what we do here in terms of organising is, absolute, is, absolutely, is absolutely central. And um, he talks about why it is that you can't read from the, from the, last, few, from the last few months the question of the, um, the idea that the, that the masses are fed up with the revolution. 
Um, he says that if you if you think that the um, if you think that the masses are fed up from the rev- with the revolution, you can't possibly see uh, the, the possibilities of the situation. That you actually have to be out on the streets. Uh, anyone? He talked about the, the mass mobilisation that took place in the, in, in Tahrir on the nineteenth of uh, on the nineteenth of June, um, and and about. Uh, how you have to be clear in terms of what the brotherhood is, but you also have to say that um, you also have to say that you stand, you stand, you stand with them. That um, you actually have to unite all the forces uh, of the revolution against the uh, against the uh, against the generals. At the same time, as continuing to build to build organize to build organization. The, um, the he says there are two there are two conclusions that you can draw from the current situation. The first is to give up and say that the revolution is finished, but this conclusion has no basis in reality. The second conclusion is to say we need a second revolution. We need an extension of the revolution. We need it to deepen and develop. And the second wave of the Egyptian revolution must go right to the end. It has to break down the apparatus of the Egyptian state. It has to besiege the iron heart of the state. It has to get rid of the intelligence services and the secret police, which have been entrenched in this country, in this country for for 50, for 50 years. We need the working class to do this. We need to organise and so on. We need to bring ourselves into the, into the streets. And he, finishes in, and, 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 he, and he finishes here and says, anyone who's depressed today, this means that his faith in the masses are failing and we have no right to do this. Anyone who participated in the Egyptian revolution, anyone who even saw the Egyptian revolution on TV has no right to doubt, even for a moment, the power, the power of the masses. Everything that we're doing is to work consistently to build the mass organisation. When they say to you, the masses, it's all over, you'll never cre- complete the, the revolution, we have to say the opposite. Whoever is frustrated today and is sitting at home thinking there isn't any point, everything's gone wrong, Shafiq will be president, the army is totally in control, is helping the army and is playing a role against the revolution. There is no place and no time for despair or for retreat or for fear. I think if people who are really genuinely facing tanks outside their front door can say that, then we can build here. We can build a hot autumn. We can build the mass strikes. We can build revolutionary socialist organisation. Please join us. Thank <laughs> you.